Hello, everyone, and welcome to another live broadcast from True Fire Studios. Actually, we're not broadcasting from the studio, as you might imagine, but we're hunkered down in different locations, and we're making this thing work. And I've been waiting for this one for a long time because we've got two of my very, very favorite people on the planet, Cheryl Bailey, who we will start with, and then John Harrington. So, um, man, we've been working with Cheryl for a very, very long time. I, I remember meeting and interviewing, in, interviewing Cheryl at a symposium in Washington many, many years ago. And since then, she, you know, a rising star is an understatement. She has played with everybody. She is a very passionate, passionate educator, an amazing, just an amazing player, an amazing educator. Um, we'll talk about some of our courses in a moment, but, you know, we have, uh, actually, this is the first time I'm announcing to the world that we have new educator pages. Uh, Seth is scrolling through that and you can see all of Cheryl, you know, Cheryl's bio, all of her courses, all of her live events, um, all her five star reviews, 14 of them right in a row right there. <laughs> um, Cheryl has her own channel. We'll talk about that, her True Fire Artist channel, which is just killer. And uh, Cheryl will also do private lessons. Um, recently, while Cheryl was a, a professor at Berkeley in the guitar department, she is now the assistant chair of the entire guitar department at Berkeley, which is an awesome thing. She's got great new digs. We're going to have a look at that in just a sec. Uh, but uh, Cheryl, I could go on forever because you have a pedigree a mile long. But let's say hey to you. Hey, back to you. All right. There you are. <laughs> so in a very cool section of Boston, um, we actually chatted just a couple days ago and caught up. Mm -hmm. And uh, life is good for you up there, yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Beautiful. I mean, well, I was a New Yorker. I still am a New Yorker. They are not used to that yet in Boston. <laughs> but know. I'm. They're getting used to me here. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> it's a baseball thing, right? I don't know. Well, it's sometimes just on the street. It's a little thing, but you know, people walk a little slower here, so <laughs> they're getting used to me here. But I, I moved up here um, last uh, almost a year ago to yeah. uh, to take this gig here at Berkeley. It's a big gig, man. I mean, it's a, a big gig, <laughs> a big, big gig. And, uh, you know, we chatted the other day. You're busier than ever on, you know, on the educational front, on the music front. I mean, um, you know, you're making big things happen. So, you know, no big surprise here can tell you that. <laughs> Well, thank for thank you to you guys for just helping me develop my whole thing that I do. You know, I have so many students that come in, new students, particularly from um, Asia, and they all know the the etudes and they know the essentials. <laughs> you know, and they're kind of like they're a little nervous to say hi to me. I'm like, hey, Kai, welcome. And I know it's so <laughs> cool, man. It's so cool. Um, so, uh, we're going to do a few things today. I know, you know, everyone's anxious to hear you play, of course, and then we'll talk more about some of the courses and we'll talk about the channel, um, in particular, cause you're doing, you know, some extraordinary stuff there, but why don't you kick us off, play something, tell us what you're going to play and play. Okay. It. Well, I could play a song, one of my compositions, okay. um, would you like to see, take a look at it for a second? Of course. Since this is all educational, I can do this whole little screen share to, oh, I need to maybe have that enabled. Maybe we can look at it later, but this is a tune of um, a very good friend of mine into the guitar world, um, Vic Juris, yeah. passed away. Um, and uh, this is a song that I wrote for him it's called One for VJ, and the story of the song is that we were hanging out a lot and uh, playing. We had this Hendrix project we used to do, 
Anyway, one day afternoon, I wrote this song. It just kind of came out. I was like, this is the most amazing song I ever wrote to me. That's it. Beautiful. Later on the day, I got home, and I started to play through it, and I realized that I'd actually written Vic's song, Sweet uh. Sixteen. But I thought it was mine. It was so, it just uh. came out. Uh -huh. So I said, okay, let me revise this a little bit. So I went, and I fixed it up. I changed it. So it is not Vic Juris' Sweet Sixteen, but I had to give him credit. So this is for my great friend. I'm going to play this with a looper. I hope. It, let me know if the sound is weird or something. I'm, but anyway, the organ trio recorded this on our Meeting of Minds recording. And uh, anyway, this is for our dear friend, Vic Juris, the great guitarist, Vic Juris. It's called One for VJ. <laughs> like that <laughs> oh sorry i had to mute very nice That's um, okay. that was beautiful man is the ba you, sound are, balance is hard to tell i got a little thrown off as a little funny situation here but tommy how's the sound it sounded yeah, good to me it sounds okay. pretty good to me right. too yeah cool good. it's tough you know uh as i'm sure you know you must do a ton of stuff online now but you know, every, you know, every now and then the internet gets, you know, a little congested. There's a little hiccup here and there, um, right. but it, it sounded terrific uh, okay. to me. Um, so teach us, give us a little, just a little taste of anything 
from, in, in fact, let's show your library first. Okay, <laughs> sure. Because I, I really want to show people this incredible body of work here. Um, we've done, uh, you know, uh, I think, did we start with uh, Bebop uh, Essentials? Was that our first one? I think that's the first one we did, yeah. And we then did it together we... on the spot. S sorry? <laughs> you, you and I did that on the spot. I, I had know. a whole thing planned, and then you came down, and I came down there, and you asked me some questions, and then it morphed into what yeah, it is. It was killer. It's... You know, Bebop <laughs> Dojo Essentials. Um, we did uh, a, a, a Bebop Blues Etudes. I love that. I'm working on that. It's a, a oh. lifelong project, but I'm working on it. <laughs> um, we did some Bebop Etudes. You gave us a whole vocabulary and 50 essential Bebop guitar licks you must know. Um, you know, it's just a, an extraordinary body of work. Um, describe, if you will... What is bebop? How would you describe bebop? <laughs> well, I guess, you know, in historical terms, it's the music that happened. Well, I credit Charlie Parker, the alto saxophone player, as the father of, of bebop. And, and I see bebop as the, gives birth to contemporary jazz and modern harmony. Dizzy Gillespie was a trumpet player who, who collaborated with uh, Charlie Parker. And a friend of mine said to me that Dizzy Gillespie was to harmony what Einstein was to science. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and so I feel that what, what these guys developed about harmony and rhythm um, have influenced everything since then. So sort of, I feel this way about um, a painter like Picasso. If you're going to be a modern painter, a contemporary painter, you have to deal with him. You cannot ignore him. Mm -hmm. So that's what I feel about, in particular, Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and these innovators and that music is that everything that comes from to contemporary times, you have to check this out to get to understand how we got to where we are now. So we're talking about music, um, you know, roughly from 1940s, 1950s up till today, um, it, around the time of World War II in the States, there were big bands, right? So, but all those guys had to go off and fight the war. And so there were small groups. So that's the other thing is it sort of um, developed in these smaller bands. Um, definitely in New York City was sort of the heart of it. It has that urban uh, forward movement and aggression. Um, and uh, incredible virtuosity that's required to, to play this music. So, so that's kind of a real generic overview of what that is. Um, it was not, in my opinion, innovated so much by guitarists other than Charlie Christian. So I feel there's a challenge for us as guitarists to try to learn how to play that language on the mm -hmm. guitar, because it's not, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily feel comfortable there. So it's a challenge, but, so, well, it's definitely a challenge that I've tried to take on. Well, <laughs> you, uh, you've apparently uh, succeeded quite well. Now, there's in your teachings, there's, I'm not going to name the scale, I'm going to let you do that. Uh, but I get so much feedback about that bebop scale. Yeah. Um, tell us about that. Okay. I think you're asking about the microcosmic bebop line. That's right. The one. Yeah, that's right. So the microcosmic bebop line is actually, it's just a, a lick that was in a very common chord progression called 2-5, right? So for instance, if I had a C minor 7 and F7, that's called a 2-5. And so it's a lick that goes with that. And the lick goes... That's, that's the microcosmic bebop line. So this is, maybe I found it in a Joe Pass solo or somewhere. I was sitting around messing around with that lick and I realized within that line, that lick, I can tell you everything you need to know about how to use, for one thing, there's an element in here called the bebop scale, the dominant seven bebop scale. 
So, which is this, if I start from F, that would be an F7 bebop scale. You put a little chromatic note in there. So that's called the F7 bebop scale. So from that lick, the microcosmic bebop line, I can show you all the correct uses of that scale and all the arpeggios and substitutions that you need to know know to put together a good bebop line not only so so that's the micro right it's the yeah. little lick the cosmos is to show you how you can use it in hundreds of situations thousands of situations musically beyond just a two five that's the cosmos it's it's killer and we get so much <laughs> you know, so much great feedback on that. I, I love that scale and it really does, you know, for me, and I think for a lot of students kind of really open up an understanding of how to navigate, you know, changes. What right. in your, you know, how uh, integrated or influenced is bebop and, and the blues? Talk about their relationship. Well, I mean, I feel that Blues is, well, first of all, blues is really, we can say this is a real American song form. It didn't exist. Frankie and Johnny is the first blues, right? It's a song form, but also a feeling and a sound, right? So everything comes from the blues. To me, I mean, Charlie Parker was an amazing blues player. They're all, they all came up playing the blues. And in my, for my taste, great jazz always has blues element in it. Mm -hmm. So whether you're playing on an actual blues form, song form, or you're just playing lines, that feeling of the blues, I think to me, is what gives excitement and passion into the music. So I, I think, you know, anyone who's serious about, obviously on guitar, it's, it's a very guitaristic thing. It's a gu guitaristic form, but it's really connects us to all the musics, contemporary musics all come out of the blues. So um, one of your courses for, you know, what, you know, we have some, you know, we, we obviously have a very strong blues student body as well as a strong jazz student body. And, you know, um, anybody that's playing the blues here at True Fire wants to jazz up their blues a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we did that mm -hmm. one project. Guys, could you show the bebop blues etudes? So I, I would say this, I, I know that one of our goals was to remain true to bebop and to teach bebop to anybody that's serious about, um, you know, learning how to play bebop and playing jazz, making sure there's enough headroom in there for the jazzers so they don't feel we're dragging them back. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, our vision for Cheryl's entire library is how can we get blues players to kind of now start to jazz up their blues? And I think, you know, if you look at B Bebop uh, Blues Etudes, for example, that's a great way to get going. You have, uh, of course, the first course, Bebop Dojo Essentials, right? And then uh, the 50 Bebop Licks thing. So talk about, you know, like, you know, a lot of players don't like to think of themselves as a lick player, right? Mm -hmm. And yet mm -hmm. you're going to encounter so many common progressions, you know, in, in the jazz songbook, 251 minor, 251 major, what, what have you. So can you tell us um, what advice would you give a student, you know, um, to approach you know, learning licks as a starting vocabulary to start to play bebop. You mm -hmm. think that's a good thing or a hurtful thing? No, I think it's a great thing because if you don't want to be a lick player, you won't be. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, like, some, so I don't want to learn a bunch of licks. I don't want to be a lick player. Well, if you don't want to be, you won't be. But having those terms are very helpful. So this is a very deep correlation to spoken language. If I want to go to France and I want to get around town and get directions and find out where this and that, I need some licks. I need mm -hmm. some phrases. And that's how you start in learning a language. It gives you a point of where you can enter and start to communicate. Now, depending on how deep I want to get into it and really communicate in my new language, 
I'm going to have to move deeper into learning the licks. But those phrases, of course, are necessary to learn structure, grammar, cadence, pronunciation, all that. What if, what if we say that to the parallel of spoken language? So if you want to get deeper with it beyond just being able to spit out your couple licks to where you can start to have a conversation about philosophy or you can read a book or you start to dream in your new language, any of these levels of mastery of a language, of course, use all those little elements, but it's not contrived. So I feel that we all need to learn those little elements. At first, it might seem contrived. Here's my lick. But at the same time, this is all a doorway to being able to communicate on a deeper mm -hmm. level. And you learn to learn a lot of instrument. You learn about, about harmony. You learn about articulation. You learn about timing. So there's so many musical elements that you learn when you're studying that process. That's a great answer. Um, which is, uh, you know, not uncommon to come out of your mouth. <laughs> you, you have a great way. We've talked about this a million times. You just have a great way of, uh, you know, explaining oftentimes some very sophisticated, you know, jazz concepts, but in a very accessible way. And I, I, I love uh, that explanation. <laughs> Um, get ready to play another tune. I'm going to do a little housekeeping okay. here and okay. then you'll play another tune, but I want to draw everybody's attention, please, to the links underneath the video. If you're, you know, chatting with us live on YouTube, um, underneath the video, there's some really, really important links. Uh, uh, there's a check-in and a tip jar. Um, certainly tips are very much appreciated absolutely not required 100 percent of your tips go to the artist to support them during these rather challenging times for sure but there's also a check-in and if you check in um which costs you nothing um you're entered in a random join you can win a hundred dollar gift card uh at true fire and buy all of cheryl's courses so check in at the very least um, also, while you're underneath the video, you see that little thumbs up thing, go give that a click. It is the best way to kind of show your appreciation, show your love and spread the love. And then there are two links, uh, Cheryl's links. One of those, again, underneath the video will lead you to all of Cheryl's courses, channels, private lessons, everything that Cheryl's got going on at True Fire. And uh, there's also a, a link, of course, to Cheryl's website. And then there's a link to Cheryl's channel, which we'll talk about after this next performance. Stage is yours. All right. I thought I'd play. I have a track here. I'm not, this, is, this is a little, I find it, well, it's not my favorite to play with a track, but that's what we have right now. Mm -hmm. This is a track of um, a rhythm change um, that I'm going to play along with. Hopefully this sounds pretty good. Rhythm change is a, is a core core progression in jazz and bebop. And um, I teach a big section of this in my harmony class at Berkeley and on my channel and whatnot. Anyway, so it's based on the core changes, the rhythm changes are based on the Gershwin standard, I've got rhythm. And it is such a challenging core progression and a fun core progression that people have written alternate melodies or alternate heads to them. So there's tons of them, Olio and Anthropology and Moose the Mooch and all that. So there's a whole kind of repertoire and language for this. So I'm just gonna have some fun and play on rhythm changes. Great, and one quick question for you because you know, rhythm changes comes up so often. Why is that such a seminal kind of set of changes that uh, what, what's so significant about that, in your opinion? Yeah, well, it's one of those things that often players, well, for instance, the rhythm change is the challenge in the melodic line as the rhythm changes. So, I'm sorry, I'm going to sing. I've got rhythm, I've got music, I've got my man, I should ask for anything more, right? So there's a very specific chord change so that your melody should bring 
bring out those core changes. So it's a challenge to do that. But what I would say from an educational point of view, why I get into rhythm changes a lot is because the structure of it is one, six, two, five, which is a turnaround. Every jazz song you'll ever play has a turnaround. It goes one, six, two, at the end of the song, every song. So it's something that if you learn how to learn it in this context, you're gonna use it thousands of times. There's also a little section in the rhythm change where you go two, five to the four chord. So in this case, F minor seven, B flat to E flat, A flat seven. That little nugget is in thousands of songs, thousands, literally thousands. So why I work on this a lot with my students at Berkeley and on Truefire is because if you learn those two little nuggets, there, you're going to see them everywhere. So you walk into a jam session, not only someone could call rhythm change, but they could call any of these thousands of chord progressions that have those little elements in it. And then you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I know how to do that. Mm -hmm. That's, let's do it. Awesome. So, so anyway, I'm going to call let's this do up. It. I hope the balance of this is cool. This is so wacky, but we'll try. See what happens. I need to turn that up a little bit. Can you hear that? Very low. How's that? There it is. All right. Nice. Beautiful. Is um, the balance okay? Oh, it wasn't. It, it was pretty good to me. Tommy, were you happy with that? Yeah, it was there. Zoom was doing its thing to, you know, destroy it. But it was, okay. <laughs> it, was it was hanging tough in there when it could. You know, you, I had you such know, a great sound check. And then when my cat came through and ran through everything, it kind of upset You know, it, it's really all cool. Our audience is so um, understanding of the challenges. <laughs> Um, speaking of our audience, we love to shout out to folks that are tuned in live. Tommy, would you do the shout out to, um, of course. and, and if we don't shout out to you here, uh, please, uh, just let us know where you're tuned in from and we'll do that later in the show. So have at yeah. it, Tommy. Yeah. So we've got folks tuning in, Cheryl. I mean, you're, you're looking and sounding great, by the way. Um, okay. Folks all over the world, uh, San Diego, Belgium, Nantucket, Tampa, right across the pond here, Connecticut, mm -hmm. London, Chicago, Jacksonville, Dallas, Homestead, Florida, Red Bank, New Jersey, a lot of Florida chiming in today, actually. Calgary, Ireland, Germany, West Indies, that's cool, Detroit, wow. San Pedro, California, Charleston, South Carolina, Sweden, 
Hattiesburg, um, on Oxnard, California, Queensland, Australia, Munich, Santa Cruz, Loch Lamont, Scotland. That's killer. Red Lodge, Montana. Nice. Hopefully, uh, getting some, uh, getting close to fly fishing time out there in, uh, Montana anyway. That'd be very cool. Anyway, folks all over the world chiming in here to watch you and enjoying your plan, Cheryl. So very oh, cool. Thanks, thanks guys for wow. chiming in and keep, keep those coming in the chat and we'll, we'll shout out to you later. I, I love, I always, I mean, always, the audience is probably sick of me saying it, but um, it flips me out, man. Like all the different time zones, all of the different, you know, continents, people from all backgrounds, race, creed, color, political leanings, whatever, you know, we come together, you know, for an hour and share, you know, our, our passion uh, for music and for the guitar. It's just, you know, it's killer, man. Um, also, I want to encourage everyone to, I'm going to ask Cheryl a couple of your questions right now. Um, but uh, post your questions in the chat. And yeah, I'd, I'd really love can, to know what people want to ask. I, I know. She loves to I love questions. I love it. Questions. So here's one for you from Brogue. Um, Cheryl, do you hear the solo in your head when you play it? Mm hmm that's part a and then part b is how do you study a tune like you know you get some changes where should you start you know learning a tune and learning how to improvise over it that's a really great question those are deep questions too first of all yes um ultimately you want to train yourself and this is takes time right to to play what you want it what you hear so also i want to bring this up this comes up a lot with uh, in terms of we were talking about putting bebop or jazz lines on the guitar, they're not necessarily guitar friendly. So there's articulation. So, I, you know, I, I always want to try to sound more like a horn player than a guitar player. So sometimes you have to figure out ways to play them. But the number one way that you can get this, and this ties into Brad's question earlier, why do they call it bebop? Because bebop, bebop, right? That's where the accent is in the phrasing. So if you can hear that inside, well, let's put it this way. I hear that kind of phrasing, that scat solo in my inside. And then I can trust the notes at this point on the guitar. So, so if I think. Which isn't so great, but I'm. It, what's more important to me is I'm feeling that where those accents are and that that kind of articulation. So I often just say to people, this one you can do for free. Just get a Charlie Parker recording or Cannibal Adderley or De any of those great horn players, Clifford Brown, and just sing along with it. It doesn't even matter if you ever played on your guitar. Yet that's the inner language of jazz. That sound of that scat. And there are no rules to it. Just try to listen to what it really sounds like, not what you think it sounds like, but what it really sounds like and imitate that with your voice. And it's fun, it's fun to do. You can have fun doing that. But if you start to take that then to when you play the guitar and you hear that inside. So again, that's sort of like going back to a spoken language. If you get really good speaking French, you start to dream in French. You know what I mean? Like you can tell jokes and like you get it so deep inside that it's a part of you. You can't separate yourself from it. So that's to me how you develop that and getting in touch with singing and playing. Uh, great answer, of course. I kind of try to answer a couple. But the other question was about learning a tune. So that's yeah. kind of, it depends on how deep, it, again, there's only like how many levels you want to get in deep. If you said, hey, Cheryl, I want to play this song on my gig next on Friday, and I don't have a lot of time to practice it, I'm, I'll try to find a reliable lead sheet just for the gig. But it, if I really want to take that song and learn it, you know, for instance, if it's a, if it's a Thelonious Monk song, I'm going to find as many recordings of Thelonious Monk playing it because he's the boss of the song. He wrote it, so he knows how it should be played because I want to respect how it should be played. So I'm going to listen to him play it. 
or if it's a standard, what we call American songbook song, like a rhythm change or um, there'll never be another you. One of those, I want to find as many versions of that song to listen to so I can understand how it's actually played. And, um, and then I'm going to, and then either I'm going to make my own lead sheet, I'm going to transcribe it, or I'm going to find a really good source for it, which can be difficult. A reliable source and then I take all that together and I start to put it onto my instrument so personally I like to I'm more of a harmony person so I will usually learn how the melody relates to the harmony the math of the song for instance these things we were talking about one six two five or one four five that's math of how harmony works so I'll memorize the math so memorize the math of the chord progression and also how does the melody it there's like this melody starts on the ninth on uh long came betty right so i know that it goes up to the ninth. so so i kind of for me i kind of learn it in a batch like that together with the, how the chords and the melody really you know it's a great question to ask different players because i think everybody has their own approach but that's for me listening studying and then getting the math together and then putting it on my instrument. Great, man. So um, there was actually a part C to Brogue's question, and I've, I've got a ton of great questions for you today. Um, and the part C was, how do you add the bop? And I loved your explanation um, when you scattered and, and showed us where the bops were, you know? Can you just, for demonstration purposes, take a line and and bop it up, like play it straight and then bop oh. it up. Well, that's a great question. You know, and just because this also ties into swing. Um, you know, for instance, it, it, people, it defies definition, swing. Like, it, but people try to write it in a book and they'll say, <laughs> swing is this sort of triplet feel like. <laughs> which is the opening to Donna Lee, but that's not swinging, right? The no so this is always a thing where it's correct, but it ain't right. Uh -huh. The notes are correct, but it ain't right because it ain't swinging. So the reason why it doesn't swing is because it's symmetrical the way it's being played. So that is not true that it's a triplet thing because that then it's even and it's heavy and it's predictable. And the thing that's exciting about jazz rhythm and feel and articulation is that it's not predictable. So that entails trying to feel that accent in different places in the beat, right? Um, and then that's, that's going to push it forward. That's what really makes it swing. Now, I learned this directly from Emily Remmler, the great, the great late Emily Remmler taught me this. Um, and sometimes again i can concentrate i don't need to worry m myself so much about the notes that i'm going to play I, I you know I, i'd even take wrong notes if it feels good you know what i mean like to me that's what's got to be underneath everything is that feeling and the articulation so so i think that's the first part of it is to really start to understand and uncover how the the accent can change in the beat so oh. give us a, play that same line and swing it and then bop it. So the line really goes, not da 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 So the original way, everything's the same and it's heavy. The other one, sometimes the notes come in and out. Right? They're not all the same. So the best way you can do it, if you listen to a great bebop drummer, listen to Max Roach or or Philly Joe Jones or uh, Jimmy Cobber and those guys. If you hear a nice bebop drummer play, they play basically the ride symbol is basically the quarter note. Ding 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 and where they place the accent on the snare and the bass drum. They call that dropping bombs. That was the big innovation in bebop, from bebop style to the swing big banner. So I'm nerding out. 
I mean, you just got me on nerd. Oh, but, but we love it. So I, I have more, more questions for okay, you. Ready? Okay. <laughs> um, here's a, here's a good one. Um, how do you develop your time feel to stay consistent when playing and improvising? So how do you work on, on this time thing you're talking about and, and stay like in the pocket? That's a great question. I am a metronome fanatic. And you know what's great with these phones now, with the digital metronome, is that you can, you can go down to almost nothing or blazing. But the most important thing for me in working with a metronome is that I treat it like I'm playing with a drummer, like a real drummer. So I, I call this personifying the metronome. So a lot of people find it, well, let's put it this way. When I was a student, here I'm back living in Boston after 30 years or so away. When I was a student at Berkeley, there was a pile of broken metronomes that I threw, smashed them at the wall. <laughs> I, and the reason why, I'd get so mad and I'd be like, oh, and I'd throw them, smash. Because I thought the metronome was telling me that I suck. And you know what? It was right. But that's not the point. I had to change the way and, and change my relationship with the metronome and go, you know what? This is an opportunity to play with the wor a perfect drummer every day. That's amazing. And that's so that psychologically will get you in the frame of mind of playing with the metronome. And really, the metronome is just training your time so that when you don't have the metronome, your time is solid. That's just training. But so. When I put the metronome on, I'll imagine it's Jimmy Cobb or it's Max Roach or any whatever drummer. If you're a rocker, it's John Bonham or whoever you love. You know, if you're playing that kind of thing, just imagine with all your, I mean, devotion is the word I use, that I'm in the room with them and they're just playing, snapping their finger on two and four, and I'm going to groove with them. Because really what that does is train me that's always my habit. I put, get out my guitar, put my metronome on and play with it and groove. When I get to play with a great drummer, I'm doing the same thing. Does that make Very sense? Cool. Yes. Yes, it does make sense. I'm interested, like, you know, as you describe swing feel and the bop feel and you're kind of playing around with time. Are you doing that while you're practicing with a metronome? Yeah, I think. Yes, all the time, because, you know, the, the time is really the space between notes. It's really the feeling that pulse and how you fra how do you feel from this space and time to that space and time. So, you know, and, and now sometimes I have with my students in person, I have these bouncing balls. Right. And we'll just do that. and We'll bounce them with the metronome just to get that sense of there's physical space. Right. So time and rhythm, these things are and technique also. I, they're separate topics, but there's a place in the middle where they meet. And relaxation is the place like you have to be really relaxed with the time. The, and relaxation is the is the unifying principle of virtuo virtuosity. No matter what instrument or style, if you watch Vladimir Horowitz, you see pure relaxation. If you watch Jimi Hendrix, you see pure relaxation doesn't matter the instrument or genre that's the key and so working with your metronome to find that place where you can feel the time and move with the time because time is that element or rhythm is the physical element of music right so the ancient greeks were right on it they said melody is the mind harmony is the heart and rhythm is the body right so the more that you can use your metronome also to just move your body with it and move in time. It's relaxing. It's fun, right? So if you find every tempo, every groove, every feel has its own movement. And I call that the pocket Tai Chi, right? I love it. So you learn how to move through time with the metronome and then it's natural. It's not something that you're trying to do. It's mm -hmm. just something that you're doing. Awesome. A <laughs> um, couple more questions for you. Actually, you know what? Um, play another tune. I want to make you, oh you have a couple more and I want to make sure we get some playing in here as well. And okay. then, uh, we'll do some more Q and a, okay. Let me find something here. Um, something that might be fun. 
No, I'm not going to play that one. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. I'm going to find something here. I like having a little bit of the drums going here. But, um, okay. How about this one? Let's see how this goes. Oh, maybe it won't go. Ah. This is changes to Have You Met Miss Jones? Oh. I think. Nice. I'm going to adjust my volume here. You're getting good at running those backing tracks and stuff, huh? Oh, jeez. So um, I, I do have more questions for you, but I want to talk about your channel, right? Like yes. you, I think you did a great job, you know, in the last segment, um, kind of showing your, <laughs> your ability to convey, you know, the really fundamental questions we all have. A lot of them are like mysteries to us, right? <laughs> and too. you just clear the sky. Right. So guys show Cheryl's channel and Cheryl talk about what, what you do in the channel. That's really different than what you do in say the courses. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a big library there of stuff. It's sort of like the college of Bailey. <laughs> um, and so things are broken down into, uh, for instance, uh, there's a whole section of, of discussions about harmony. And I just started actually a harmony workshop, sort of a separate little sub folder. So there's folders there and you can explore them. And basically they go from simple to complex. Maybe um, there's a whole thing about m developing melodies and melodic ideas and scales, how to finger scale, how to play your arpeggio. I mean, and they're even like down to nuts and bolts about three octave triads. There's a section called nuts and bolts, which is all about that. 
there's a section of interviews with some of my colleagues and I'm sure people that you folks know, right? Jack Wilkins and, and uh, Gary Granger and just some amazing uh, folks there. Um, there's breakdowns on jams and how to approach tunes. There's also a section there, a folder where I post um, some jam tracks that are made with some really great rhythm section players from New York where you can download them. And it's been great. I've had a group of people recently that have really been downloading and then you can upload your own video of you playing and your questions. So I guess the other thing that's cool about it is it's my library there, but you can ask questions and you can interact with other people who are also subscribers. Um, you can post your own videos about the material. Um, and if there's something, I always send out notes, if there's something that you don't see in there that you want specific content for, just let me know and I'll create it for you. Yeah, the um, uh, Cheryl's channel, and actually you were one of the very first yeah. brave <laughs> souls to to say, yeah, I'll give it a go, right? Oh. So, um, you know, learning how to play music, and this wasn't lost on us, and this is one of the reasons we develop channels and, and the asynchronous private lesson thing is, you know, uh, our, the courses are great, but our courses are a lot like textbooks. You know, they're self-study. There's great information there. There's lots to do there, but, you know, to be able to connect with somebody uh, at, you know, with the stature that Cheryl has and her ability. I mean, that mentorship, uh, you know, it's priceless. I mean, for God's sakes, you know, assistant chair of the guitar department at Berkeley, <laughs> um, an artist who, if you were to name, ask anybody to name three of, you know, today's top jazz artists, jazz guitar artists, you know, Cheryl's going to be, if not at the top, she's going to be in those top three, without a doubt. Um, so, you know, it's a great way to connect with Cheryl. It's a great way to get, you know, the, the answers to a lot of the questions that you're asking here. But also, I mean, don't you, don't you think it's important, Cheryl, for uh, students to also be able to interact with one another, you know? Absolutely. Uh, uh, that's what I love about the format is people can post comments, people can get discussions going. And, uh, and I'd love to see what people do. I know also, I mean, there's the element too, where some, at a certain level, you can get a, a private lesson. And I've worked with students through true fire o over the years. And it's so, it is amazing to have that document of their progress, which is so hard for any of us to see, you know, and just, work on you know people at whatever level you know every level's open to come but i've had people top professionals come who treat it as professional mentoring and i have people that are just really getting their scales together yeah and we all have you know we all have a point where we can connect and and learn there so that's what's cool about it yeah so i will say this uh, i'm uh, we're going i think we well the link to the channel is underneath the video um, go check that out. It's you can get into this channel for five dollars a month. You can cancel any time. There's no long term commitment. And I will personally guarantee you. You go ahead. You get in at the five dollar level or the ten dollar level. If you are unhappy for any reason whatsoever, I will personally reach in my pocket and pay you twice whatever you paid for that channel. This is. I think one of the most significant, uh, you know, learning experience uh, for jazz guitar that you can find anywhere today. And, you know, and, and it has very little to do with, you know, the technology or what we've done and everything to do with the way that Cheryl has leveraged that. Well, and I think there are close to 400 videos in there. Oh, there's a ton of, uh, here, I'm looking at it right now. You <laughs> I have think a, they're close to 400, but, but yeah, it's try to, address as many topics as possible and again i'm always people say hey i'd like someone actually just last week said hey can you do a class on a minor blues i said you got it and it's going to come out the next uh, june 1st yeah which I, I love this whole quality of 
um, the channels because it's like, you know, it's an ever evolving like textbook that wraps itself around the, the wants and needs of the students. Right. And I love how responsive you are. And I really, really appreciate that. I know you, oh, you're, you're extremely busy, but on behalf of myself and all of my fellow Cheryl Bailey, Bebop Dojo channel students, thank you for taking the time to, to answer those questions and to do that stuff. Okay. I've got more questions for you. Great. We're, we're starting to run out of time. So give us your quickest, most succinctest answers. Ready? Okay. Um, do you apply the family of four on rhythm changes from George Cole? Yes. How long have you been playing guitar? Uh, for 40 years. <laughs> I shouldn't have asked that question. That was but, my birth. It was my birthday yesterday. So that's uh, happy birthday. God, I wish we knew that. <laughs> um, actually, you probably, if we yeah. had it, you, you may have gotten a little note I, from us. I got a little note. And it there was you go. Duly noted. And, and uh, when we first met, man, I, I remember, uh -huh. at, where was it? It was the symposium in Washington, D.C. or something? In Baltimore, the Guitar Congress. Yeah, it was phenomenal. You blew us away there. And I remember in that interview, you telling us the story of how you were kind of a metal rock guitar player yeah. and got bit by the jazz bug, right? Yep. Still That's so, so awesome. <laughs> okay, more questions. Uh Cheryl, can you talk about Pat Martino, who you know is, you know, struggling right now, and no. we're we're there's a GoFundMe happening, and yep. you know, uh, ha, what has talk about his influence on your playing? Mm, wow, it's it's huge. Um, well, in fact, that little thing I was talking about, Emily Remler showed me the study to work on my d dynamic in my line and the articulation came from Pat. And it really, at, at that time, as a Berkeley student, I was really immersed as, in his playing and transcribing. So it really made sense to me and really helped me understand that phrasing. I would say that his tone is, gives me goosebumps, especially to hear it live. Just one note, I'm over the moon. Definitely Desert Island recording the duet with um, Gil Goldstein. Amazing. And also an amazing composer um oh my god yeah. but also funny that you bring that up because i just posted actually on our our instagram our berkeley college berkeley guitar department instagram a photo of me with pat martino went in 1990 at i was just a little pup i was in the thelonious monk jazz guitar competition and he was one of the judges so i if you go find that there's a picture of young me and young pat martino hanging out at that <laughs> that's awesome Un unbelievable he is um you know you mentioned at the start of the show like you know you, you're not going to study modern art without studying picasso and some of the other masters uh i i would think you would include him in the masters of yes. jazz guitar that absolutely you, you know absolutely okay couple more um, let's see this one. I'm sure you probably don't have the time for, but Joshua Canning asks, can you talk about your approach to playing over the changes to days of wine and roses? It's, uh, his current obsession. So let me answer that for you and say, Joshua, go into the channel five bucks. I'll give it back to you. If it's not valuable to you and ask Cheryl in her channel. How about that? Yeah, I no. Hey, Josh, thanks for the question. I've worked with Josh on and off over the years here at True Fire. And oh, you have? Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great question, but yeah, it takes a little more than a minute. But <laughs> hopefully, um, hopefully, the goal is to swing and make some nice melodies. Okay. Matthew wants to know which three practice routines, like periodic practices, mm. would you would you suggest to be a great bebop player? What would you, pra three things that you'd practice? Well, I transcribe to learn language, right? Learn feel, learn style, uh, learn tunes. Mm -hmm. So I'd spend some time transcribing, learning, you know, solos of the masters, learning repertoire mm -hmm. and uh, trying to play with others. We'll get through this little time where we're separated, but play with others 
that are better than you that will challenge you. Taylor asks, Cheryl, what was the best or biggest piece of musical advice you got from a professional? Hmm. Um, I can't think. I don't know. Probably there's so many. There's so many. Well, Emily Remler told me, don't stop doing it. So cool. That was, that there you cool. go. Uh, Lee Candiotti, Cheryl, do you think it's beneficial to study transpose the solos of other instruments like sax, piano, trumpet, rather than just copying other guitar players? Oh, I think I might, you know, as a kid, you know, it's kind of a kid logic, but I thought all horn players do is solo. So they must be the best at it. That's, uh -huh. what, <laughs> That's when I was good. about 15. So yeah, study horn players because they're the masters of it. But all other instruments, yeah, I mean, I think we can learn about articulation. We can learn about style. We can, there's so much we can learn from the other instruments, for sure. I really encourage that. Cheryl, you're incredible. We ran a little bit over. I'm, I'm sorry. I hope you don't have all right. something butting up against this. But listen, um, we love you. You know we love you. Um, guys, please hit that thumbs up underneath the video. <laughs> show your love, check in for a chance at the $100 gift card tip if you can afford to do so. And, uh, you know, check out Cheryl's entire library. And if you're, if you're a jazz or you want to get into playing jazz, if you dig bebop, head over to the bebop dojo channel, give that a go. Uh, I, I guarantee your satisfaction. Cheryl, we love you. We love Thank you. Thanks for being here, Cheryl. Yeah. See you, Tommy. See ya. All right, I'm gonna roll a vid and we'll bring on our next guest. Brad, cool. here we go. Thanks, Cheryl. Sorry See you, Cheryl. about the the sound was so weird for me. Uh, no, it was like, awesome. It was, you were great. It was awesome. When I first started playing, I couldn't hear my loop and I was like, What? <laughs> <laughs> no, you did a great job. Wait till you read all the comments, people, you know. Yeah. You're just the best. Okay. Thank you guys. I love you guys madly. So all right. I'll let you get to your next gig. You All got right. it, man. Talk we'll to see you, you next later. time. Okay, bye. See the clock go to tick tock all the live long day. The minute hand, he's making plans. The second hand obeys. Another day. Has taken flight and won't be back again. I've got time, time on my hands. Worlds of time, time on my hands. So she left. All right, folks, it's time to introduce John Harrington. Uh, John is, you know, he is absolutely one of my guitar heroes. I mean, without a question of, about that. Um, if, if I could play like anybody on this planet, it would probably be John. Um, and, you know, he's got a pedigree a mile long, and, and I'll let you look that up on his site or on True Fire. But I will tell you that, you know, I had heard about John for years and years, um, but I'd never heard him play live. And I went to Chicago. It was a Steely Dan concert. I think Larry Carlton was a guest artist. I'm pretty sure it was Keith Carlock on drums. Um, I'm a Steely Dan fan from way back when, but I could not take my eyes off of John Harrington and his 336 and the other guitars he played. Just absolutely blew me away. And um, uh, I forgot, I, I forget how we chased John down. He's, he's probably one of the busiest musicians on the planet. Um, you know, musical director and, and gu guitarist for Steely Dan. His, the John Harrington band plays with a host of other folks, passionate educator. I mean, this cat is a busy cat, but somehow or another, I think I, I begged and, uh, 
and uh, got John to come in. And we've got two great courses, Era IQ. We'll talk about those in a minute. But without further ado, let's bring John into the frame. Hey, man. Hey, hey Brad. How are you? <laughs> I'm fantastic. I, I also uh, forgot to say that, you know, after hearing you on the 336, I went out, I found one. And like a gushing little groupie, <laughs> uh, was um, it was too shy, but finally got the courage up to ask you to sign it. And it's signed and it's hung. And I will never play that thing, okay? <laughs> it's just like, it's a little shrine to you, all right? I'll admit it. Uh, well, you're, um, you're too kind. It's, it's, uh, thank you so and much for that. You <laughs> are one of the busiest cats in the industry. How, how do you manage to do all of these things? <laughs> how do you manage that? Well, I'm less busy, right? <laughs> Let me tell you. Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you know, um, I, I, ever, I don't really think of myself. I mean, I know that my calendar is full, you know, under normal circumstances. But, but you know, I've never been extremely ambitious trying to work with that many people. I, I just, I think I've just been just so lucky, you know, uh, to have sort of been in the right place at a couple of really key moments in my life. And, uh, it, you know, one thing led to another, as, as happens in this business, you know, that's the only way it happens, it seems to me. And, uh, you know, it's, it's mostly for the last 20, 15 or 20 years, almost all my work has been uh, with like three, three separate, pro well, now four projects. Uh, you know, Steely Dan is a big one, of course. <laughs> yeah, I'd uh, say. I work a lot with Madeline Peru, who's a fantastic singer. Who's, yeah, unbelievable. Uh, we've been doing that for over a dozen years off and on. And uh, somehow, miraculously, uh, the touring hasn't conflicted so much where she said, forget about you, uh, I need somebody who's available all the time. You know? So, so um, you know, um, that's another one. And uh, the other one was my own band, which I, I basically try to get done in the cracks of uh, touring, you know, um, and the holes on the count in the counter then. And uh, the other thing is, uh, Recently, Jim Beard, uh, the keyboard player in Steely Dan, an old buddy of mine for mm -hmm. many, many years, uh, fantastic composer and uh, keyboard player. Uh, he uh, and I, um, I don't know why it took us 40 years, but we, we just did our first duo record recently, and uh, it's called Chunks and Chair Knobs. And uh, we, we uh, had a tour in progress promoting that stuff, which was interrupted by the coronavirus, of course, but uh, yeah. so we had to come home and cut it short. But, um, but those four things have, have really been, that feels like a great variety. Like I'm never at a loss, you know, for stuff to work on and opportunities. Uh, but it doesn't feel, you know, as ambitious or as wide ranging as, as, as some people. You know, some people are just assertively like trying to find new gigs all the time. And, and, and I'm, I've been just happy because I found a few that are just so rewarding and have so much opportunity year after year after year that I've, I've been very happy to just sort of stick with, with them, you know, and, uh, so, well, I mean, I mean, but it does fill my calendar. You're right about that. It, it does fill, you know, it's hard to even get you on the phone for God's sakes. And <laughs> I know in your channel and I, I, I will talk about your channel in a bit, but I, I love those videos and, you know, the hotel rooms or backstage <laughs> or wherever you happen to be in the world. It's kind of like, we're a fly on the wall of wherever John Harrington is in the world. Um, you know, but the thing with you, man, that really uh, for me is very, very impressive is yes, there are some very busy musicians that do a lot of, you know, a lot of session dates or recording dates, but you know, your thing is very focused, you know, and when you're focused on one thing, um, you know, that takes a lot of energy, you know, and a lot of discipline, right? And the things that you do are so different, right? Like, you know, the Steely Dan thing, the John Harrington bed, they're all very, very dis different and very focused. Um, they are different. Anyway, I'm gushing. I can't well, help but well, to gush well, with you. Um, those are interesting. That's interesting. I mean, I always felt like, um, and this has always been sort of, well, it's something I used to worry about a lot and I, I don't anymore. <laughs> it's been thankfully many years, but that I haven't worried about it, but I was, when I was young, I was, I was a fan of so many different types of music as I learned 
about it, you know. And, um, you know, I grew up playing uh, basic sort of, uh, you know, kind of bar band rock and roll in the, you know, in the late 60s. And, uh, and um, from there graduated, uh, I started getting interested in music that had some more chord changes, uh, like Stevie Wonder tunes and things, and I said, what, what, what's going on there? And it led me to a study of jazz for, for a long time. And, uh, but you know, in college I was into Joni Mitchell folk tunings on the acoustic guitar, and you know, I, I just, I've always had like, a, a, and I love classical music, I just love so much music that uh, I, I'm not like some people who had a calling for one particular style, you know, and did that from the very beginning when they started playing. They only did that and they never did anything else. They couldn't do anything else, but it just wasn't in their nature. Uh, and I think in some ways it, it made it, it, it made it take a longer time for me to get to some more personal place because I had a knack to be able to, you know, get in the game in, in a lot of these different styles and it sort of groomed me for a, a like a session player's uh, work type of work, which I was able to do for a while. But what avoided me was this feeling that I was really developing myself personally as, as a player with a, with a particular, you know, you know, unique vision. And it wasn't until I had these repeated opportunities, and Steely Dan was the big one, um, of playing, you know, the same music in the same style with, the, with the, a lot of the same musicians year after year, the same great tunes with stakes that were high, big audiences, a, a good paycheck with high responsibility to perform well. You know, all that stuff was what it took for me to sort of get me focused, you know, like you say focused. I mean, and I don't think I was focused for many, many years of my, my playing career. But I was able to take that idea that like the light bulb went off for me after a few years of Steely Dan. Like, Oh, this is how you do it. You know, you, you listen back to what you did the first tour and you say, well, I can do better than that. And you have another chance to do it. And not only just like another gig, you know, but you have an entire like eight week tour or something to get it together and to, and to up your game. And I would always be thinking of, I'd always be in the hotel room trying to like say, well, I wish I could do something. I think I could do something better on this tune, on that tune. So, you know, I would take this stuff home and, and uh, try to make it make it better and, and you know this is 20 years now and to me that was I mean it started to dawn on me after two or three tours that okay this this is really how I'm going to be able to sort of do that person that personal focus which I, I never felt like I had the opportunity to do <clears throat> and I tried to uh, parlay that into working with my own band too I, I realized that okay you know I've got some time off I don't have to like go back to work in the Broadway pit like the day I get home from the Steely Dan tour. I've got a little money in the bank and I can finance my interest in developing my own band. So I was able to take that same idea of focus that the Steely Dan band had provided me with uh, and apply it to my band. And, um, and you know, that just, that has just been a, a, a great gift. And uh, so in a way, the, the, this feels like a narrow bunch of opportunities, but, but they're just so deep that I, I just, I couldn't be happier. I'm, I'm a lot happier as an adult well, <laughs> than um, I was as a kid. <laughs> you're, listen, your fans and your students couldn't be happier either because we, we get the benefit of all that. Hey, play us something. All right. You have something? Uh, well, you know, I gotta say, I, I'll, I'll uh, the, this, uh, this kind of isolation that we've been going through, it's, I think it's week nine or 10 now for me. Um, has uh, somehow I've I've uh, I've found that all I can think about is is when I'm when I'm like sitting down to play or to write something, all that's coming out are blues. <laughs> now that shouldn't be a surprise. No, no surprise at all. But um, but this was the first one that that I came up with, and and I, I guess I have to call it the pandemic blues. And uh, let's let's see if I can get it going. And this is, uh, this is sort of, what I noticed about the blues, and for some reason, again, this, this, this betrays my, my wide range rather than my focus, because I, I have three blues tunes that I'll, I'll play for you if we, if we have time. Uh, this is one, and, and I think you're going to find that they're, they're just so, they seem from, from different worlds, and yet they're all basically blues-based. So, 
Uh, that's been fascinating to me for a long time, but particularly now when, for, for whatever reason, all I can think of is the blues form and variations on it. This is, uh, this is kind of what I've been up to. So here's the pandemic blues. Let's see if I can get through this here. And tell me, uh, you want to do a little sound check or should we just go for it? Is it right? We can just go for it. Tommy? Stop me if we got if we got yeah. it. If you we we will. Issue. Okay, all right.
Well, John, that certainly <laughs> captured, <laughs> I think, all of us everywhere around the world felt that deep <laughs> down inside. That is pretty much what's going on today. Um, that was beautiful, man. Thank you for that. Um, I, a quick station break here. I want to point out that a um, couple of things. Underneath the video, there are links to John's courses. I'm, we're going to talk about that in just a sec. And also to John's channel, which we will also talk about. But there's a check-in, a link to check-in to let us know that you're here. And we're going to pull, uh, you know, give somebody a $100 gift card and get all of John's courses and all of Cheryl's courses. Um, and uh, there's also a tip jar. If you can afford it, please uh, do so. Um, at the very least, go underneath that video, click that thumbs up button. That's how we can really express our appreciation to John for carving out this time and preparing the presentation for us and to spread that love. So we'd really appreciate as many thumbs ups as you guys can muster. So I've got to talk about your two courses. You know, we have, uh, you know, I don't know, a thousand courses in our library that we've, uh, you know, produced over the last uh, 20 years or so. And your two ear IQ courses, there's nothing like that in the entire library, you know? Um, Good. <laughs> and, 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 and they really focus on something that all of us, whether we're beginners or intermediate or advanced players, um, we all love this notion of improvising. And, you know, you can't get enough insight about how to approach improvising in any style, you know, whether it's rock, blues, jazz, whatever. Um, talk a little bit, if you would, about your first one. And Seth, maybe you could show it. Um, the uh, reactive improvisation. That was the first one we did together. Yeah, the idea for that one came to me over many years of, of teaching because I, I suppose because of the, the sort of niche that I um, inhabit in the, you know, with a foot in the pop and rock and, and, and blues world and a foot in the jazz world with Steely Dan music, which is, you know, it's, 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 if, it's nothing if it's not a hybrid of, of a lot of those styles. Um, I, I think people, um, were drawn to me uh, to, to sort of, w when they were struggling with playing on chord changes that would go out of the key. I mean, I'm not, I, I don't get a lot of students who want to play giant steps changes or, or go deep into sort of like the, the jazz style, uh, you know, like, like deep harmony that's difficult to play. But, you know, the, most, most guys are, they, they, their ears are good enough to know that like the same old sort of playing in the same sort of, uh, the same typical things that they play uh, work well enough most of the time. And then occasionally a, a, like a, a song presents a chord and they know that there's something that, that they're playing. It's not working with the sound of the chord. So, and it's usually a chord that goes out of the key, you know, that's, uh, that borrows from another key and, and requires adjusting, you know, the, the, the raw material that you use as an improviser because certain notes that are, maybe in your muscle memory or that you that work on one chord don't necessarily work on that chord that goes out of the key so what i over time what i developed with with a lot of these students was a way that uh, i could teach them to use their ears and their memory to negotiate any chord change that comes in a song without having to resort to you know a, a deep theoretical study of uh of um, you know, keys, score, uh, chords, and scales. I mean, all that, that, that will get you there too. Uh, but it's a lot of work, and a lot of people don't have that kind of time. A lot of my students are, you know, are adults with, with uh, busy lives, and they only have a couple hours a day to spend at most on the, on the guitar. And, and so I needed a quick sort of practical solution to get them playing on these chord changes that would go out of the key. And uh, basically, that was the, the concept. Um, it's, it's a way to sort of use your ear to stop time in the practice room and listen to a chord that, uh, listen to any chord, the first chord as well, you know, and like go through like just 
a very, very meticulous, slow process of just listening to each note of all the 12 that you have against that chord. Decide uh, based on, you know, how, how it sounds in the style and against that chord. But you, you basically decide which notes are useful and useful for what. Um, you know, some, some notes, and you're going you're gonna to find that every note has a different unique quality against the chord that's sounding. And you basically make a, make a decision about which ones are going to be your choice notes to use as, in, in, as raw material to improvise, to, to invent, you know, melodies with. Um, and so what I, what I ended up using is a term called collections of notes. Um, for instance, if, uh, if you have a chord, um, you know, a, a simple, uh, here's a B minor seventh chord that's in our heads from that song. Um, you can listen to every single note against that, that chord and, okay, that has a certain quality. That has a diff different quality and it's not, not so consonant, not so inside. It's a, it's a sort of, a, like, it's introducing a sound that's not in that chord. Uh, here's the F sharp. That's in the chord and, and it sounds more at home. It's not, it's not an outsider, it's an insider. There's another one that sounds pretty unusable and okay, you want to remember that. Okay, I'm not going to play that G natural on the B minor 7 chord. So basically, you know, I won't do it here because the course does it much better. Uh, but that's the idea. You, you, uh, you just very, very uh, regularly just check in with each chord and how it sounds and you memorize the, the best notes that, that, that are going to work for you as raw material for improvising. And then, then the challenge is to invent melodies with, with that raw material. But, but basically, it, it demystifies uh, like the difficulty, I think, of, of, uh, of harmony um, and allows you to say, okay, look, there's only 12 notes, so you're limited. Like if you pick your favorite four or five or six or seven, then um, you, you, can, uh, you can get in the game. And uh, then it's just a question of your memory and how well you know the fingerboard. So that's, that's critical. And then, then it's the X factor of your melodic inventiveness. Uh, people who don't have uh, ideas uh, that sound musical should, should go to, should begin listening and listening to their favorite players and, and you know, work that way. By the way, uh, Cheryl was fantastic. She's, she's, she has so much knowledge and uh, it was, I, I tuned in a little bit before I had to yeah she here and send. so and she, she is she has so much wisdom and uh, and and plays beautifully so did did you do you know her you know? no I don't know that we've ever met but we may have met many many years ago if yeah. I, I don't remember but I've known I can't remember because I've seen her more on uh, online you know and on video than I than I've actually been in person with her if, if we did indeed ever meet well, but, uh, she certainly had some very nice things to say about you too. So you two should connect somehow. Well, should. Is she in Boston? I think that's where. Yeah, she she's a New Yorker, but she just moved to Boston to okay. be assistant chair of the guitar program there at Berkeley. So, uh, but you know, once a New Yorker, always a New Yorker. Um, you know what I wanted to say about the reactive improvisation that Ear IQ for the first course you did is, you know. Um, I, I love how you organize this kind of very organic process of improvisation and, you know, and you did demystify it. And what I personally really loved and, and, you know, I think I'm not alone based on the feedback to the course is you gave us, you know, the, it, the first half was the reactive approach, right? And a step by step, you know, step one, analyze the harmony. Step two, evaluate the 12 tones, like you were talking about. Right. Step three, create the collections. Step four, chord tones, then connect chord tones, then target notes and chromaticism, neighbor notes, and then add expression. So you stepped us through those eight steps. And then in the second section of the course, you show us how to apply that in a musical context. And you know, if I've read that, one, <laughs> I've read a hundred, you know, in, incredible, you know, kind of reviews. The other course, uh, let's talk about, I think is also, you know, it, 
nothing like it in the library, which is uh, Ear IQ, um, where you talked about, um, uh, you know, soloing and you gave 10 approaches for soloing. Can you talk, you know, soloing strategies? You gave us 10 yeah, soloing. Yeah. Talk about that one because that's incredible. Well, thank you. I, I, uh, I think that after we, after we got through with that first one, um, I think you and I actually put our heads together and, and decided that, that the next one should be a little less academic, even, even though I, I hesitate to call the first one academic because, again, it, it tries to avoid a and, theoretical approach yes. as much as possible. Yeah. It's, it sounds very, it's very, like, I, organic is a good word because it, it's, it feels very natural and anybody with some talent is, is going to be able to, to work that way and, and use it. So it, it wasn't academic, but I guess what I felt at, and I think talking to you, what we've, what we've felt and decided was that after one like that, it would be nice to do a course where I actually got to sort of present, you know, some, some of the, the finished product of, of this, this kind of, uh, all the work I've done to try to become a better soloist and a better improviser. And uh, so, so I was able to find uh, ten of uh, ten recorded solos of mine that that I <clears throat> that I thought were good examples of these different various uh, solo strategies as we as we decided to call them um, because there are a lot of a lot of different things that go into it it's it's very tough to uh, you know to to just sort of zero in on one and you don't think about this when you're playing as much. I mean, ideally, when you're when improvising is is at its best, you know, you're 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 doing it intuitively. You're not thinking consciously. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna use uh, some repetition and uh, vary a theme and variation uh, approach on this song here. It it kind of just happens and. Later on, when you when you go back and listen to it, you say, "Oh, okay, that's a theme and vari that was a, sort of a theme and variation thing, or or that was a, a conversation between like voices in two registers there." You know, like whatever. I mean, there's there's so many things you could you could sort of consciously do, but I I think, like I said, it, it it's not that these things sort of happen like with a plan that much. But we were able to look at these, these songs and, and pick the sort of most salient, like uh, sort of element of the solo that, that seemed like, you know, it, it would be a useful sort of educational thing, like useful sort of thing. Okay, well, sometimes you need something flashy. So I remember we had like a, one, one section where I guess I was, I think I did a bodhisattva solo or something, which, 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 you know, called for, uh, you know, some kind of flash, you know, and, uh, and, and sometimes, you know, some little tricks or something, something that, uh, you know, I mean, that just occurred to me, I mean, over, over years of playing that tune, that it felt like that was, that was kind of a thing that was working. So, uh, you know, sometimes, like I said, but, but there are other things in that, I mean, that, in that, in that solo too, you can find element, various elements of many strategies, I guess, if you look at it. But we were trying to find the one that, that each solo represented in the most uh, obvious way, you know, so because, because these can give people a springboard into sort of, okay, well, for this kind of tune, I need, I need to focus on uh, the style or the, the sound, you know. For this kind of tune, I need some flash. For this kind of tune, I think I need something like theme and variation to kind of like kind of make this effective, you know, and, and you know, people aren't always improvised, sometimes they're recording solos on, uh, in, in the studio, and there, these things can be employed even consciously, I think, to, to pretty great effect, you know, so. Yeah, I love it, so 10 strategies, I, 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 I love strategy 10, which was employ flash, <laughs> and uh, you used bodhisattva for that one, yeah. right? Then compose yourself, sing your lines, consider tradition, create collections, engage your audience, end well, think about shape, work the style, consider character. And what, you know, for 
very n not academic at all, but very insightful. So it's more like kind of aligning your creativity to to design your solo accordingly. And, um, you know, a great companion course to the first one. And uh, we've got links to both of those courses in the live chat and a link underneath the video. I think it's time for you to play another tune, though. Okay, all right. Um, you gonna play another blues for us, or yeah? Yeah, this is a this is a blues. This one, uh, I, I have to credit a, a dual inspiration for. It's uh, I, I'm calling it Philly jazz because there there are elements to me of uh, uh, John Coltrane, uh, uh, clearly one of my favorites, um, and uh, there's something about the the whole song and the. The vibe of it that, that strikes me a little like a, like a Coltrane blues or something. But also, um, there's something about it. I just woke up singing it in the morning one day. And, uh, and there's something about it that uh, reminds me of a, of a tune I learned when I was first learning jazz guitar by Pat Martino, another Philadelphia uh, resident. And uh, that tune was called The Great Stream. And it was, it was wild and pretty unusual. And uh, and so it it somehow factors in it. it I feel like it uh, it's both of those things that that kind of led to uh, this particular tune. So here it is. It, it's a it's it's a little intense. <laughs> and wish me luck. It's hard. Uh, okay, I wish you luck. <laughs> Very, very cool, man. Sounds good. So uh, this is Tommy, by the way. Brad's uh, machine went down, so he is rebooting. Okay. Um, but hey, why don't we, in the meantime, um, answer a few questions. Um, your, your tone sounds killer, by the way. I, I don't know. People are actually asking about that. And um, could you just describe a little bit about how you're getting that sound? Yeah, sure. The, the pandemic has been good to me. 
I, uh, I had a few uh, uh, pedals on order for a while, a few uh, items on order for a while, and uh, they, uh, they proved to be, um, I, I was basically ex trying to explore a way to get a good direct sound where I didn't have to use an amp. Right. And, uh, and um, I, was, I was beginning to do this long before the virus hit, but once the virus hit, all of that stuff happened to have been delivered to my home. So it was all here to try to sort of mess with. And um, I got to say, it, it's been fantastic. Um, the, basically, the, the heart of the rig is, is a bunch of pedals and um, an actual small power amp by, uh, made by Kingsley Amplifiers. Uh, nice. Simon Jarrett, I think is his name, the guy who, uh, he's a fantastic guitar player and also a great, uh, clearly a great uh, amp designer. And um, so I'm using three of his pedals on the floor, not at the same time, but uh, one is a preamp pedal. So he's, he's got the, uh, it's called a Maiden, and it's, it's, it's basically the guts of a, a Dumble uh, amplifier, a, the clean channel of a Dumble amplifier, basically. Uh, before that, I have uh, his pedal called the Minstrel, which is essentially a... A very flexible overdrive pedal, okay. But all of these have have a, a single 12x7 tube, I believe it is, in, in them. Um, and the, the third one on the floor is called the Page, which I haven't used today yet. But uh, that's actually after the preamp pedal, and that's designed to sound like the overdrive channel of a Dumble as well. So, so it's in a way, it's sort of like the guts of a Dumble amplifier in two small pedals. And then I have his uh, his tube, uh, you know, uh, stomp box, you know, uh, overdrive pedal before the nice. minstrel. So I got the order is the minstrel, the well. First of all, I, I, I'll I'll tell you the whole rig. Should I should I uh, should I plug in the phone and try to and, and show on the camera? Would you like to see the pic? The, sure. What it looks like? I can, I think I can do that. Somebody taught me this trick. If I plug the phone in. To the computer while we're on here. So have have you been doing a lot of streaming and zooming and stuff like that? Not not all that much, but I, I have been able to do some some uh, well at least one track for uh, my friend Jeff Young out in L.A. sent me a, a track to play on, and it was really fun. Let me see if this works. And and this and he loved the sound, and it was a, a direct sound. I don't have, I don't even have a guitar speaker here. Let me see if this works. Um, if I put my camera on, yeah, it works. Okay, check it out. Can you guys see that? No, not at the moment. Oh really? No. How, do, how would I get it to go to my camera? Because I, and there is a way to do that. Well, I don't want to waste time doing this, but, uh, what, what is the shot on your phone? Is it something that you can just show to the camera? Um, I'd have to move the computer. That's going to be too much, but I mean, no, basically I was just going to show you pictures of the pedal work, but, um, I guess that's not going to work. I thought it would, I thought it would but, translate. You know, so. one thing I have to say though, that has been cool, uh, about your tone, this is tone related anyway is that we can definitely tell that you are in the city because every now and then we hear <laughs> we hear the whoosh of the traffic down below yeah. and the honks of the cabs and it's like I'll being you, there man it's not as many ambulances as it was before all, all no i i miss those sounds you know i lived in the city for 25 years yeah what's it like there so, is it is it still very quiet on the streets yeah although a little less so it's definitely feeling a little like there's a little more traffic. It's a little more. Uh, it's a little more, a little more back to normal. I wouldn't call it normal yet, no. But uh, let me see. I'm trying to figure out how to get back to this Zoom meeting. Anybody have any hints about how I get the big picture up again? <laughs> uh, you you um, just want to. Click I mean, that. we can see and hear you. You just can't see us, is what I you're saying. I can't see anything. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find the the, the basic. Uh... See, is there? Uh, do you have a Zoom screen in front of you? Um, I just have. Let's see. I just have a tiny screen. It just it went small for somehow. 
when I plug my camera, oh, hide self view maybe. Hmm. Oh well. Well, I can see you, and I can see you in a small picture frame. That's all right. Okay. Well, you look good to us. Anyway, <laughs> that's what's important. So I'll I, just quickly finish about the rig, if you will. Yeah, please. I, I, I have a really mini volume pedal made by Hot One or H O T O N E. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. It's it's a volume wah, which sounds great. It has both a volume pedal and as a wah. Got a little tuner, and then uh, it goes into those three um, Kingsley. Uh, stomp boxes but then and i think this is the this is the the killer for me this was the uh, sort of the real problem solver it's it, it goes into a unit called the crucible which is a one watt power amp that kingsley makes and i've always been a fan of power amp overdrive and uh i've i've tried so many like direct sounds that are pretty good even a lot of the modeling things are pretty good but to have a real guitar power amp i mean it's it's a one watt one so it's extreme it's not loud and it has a it has a it has a way to like you can shut off the speaker i've never actually even heard it through a speaker which i, I bet it sounds great not loud but i'm just using it with the line out of that thing but he's he's so good with the electronics that the that the you're getting the sound of a real guitar power amp as well on the end of this uh, chain of stomp boxes, which has a preamp. So, so that's the that's the critical thing that that one of these stomp boxes is an actual preamp, not not like designed to go in front of a, an amp, but you can. But it, but it's replacing the front end of an amp. Then the power amp, which it's called the Crucible. That's a one watt power amp, but it just does so much for the tone. It's just, it sounds real to me. Then I, then I go into uh, the last element in the chain, which is a line six HX stomp. Mm -hmm. In there, I have a cabinet simulation and some reverb, a little delay if I need it, and a tremolo once in a while if I need it, but that's it. So uh, that's the whole rig, and, and it's, I've never heard it through a guitar speaker, but I'm not sure I ever need to. <laughs> it, it sounds Great. incredible. Maybe what you could do is when we're done here today, yeah. take a couple of shots on your I iPhone, know. send them to Tommy, okay. and then we'll post them in, in this feed or at least list the items you talked about because right. okay, uh, I, for one, will buy all of those things <laughs> like immediately, you know? A long way, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how about playing another tune for us, and then we'll yeah. ask you a bunch of questions. Well, yeah, now I, I have a choice. I mean, I could give you the last blues on the list. How are we for time? Are we got a little extra time? We're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll just play that one first. If there's extra time, I wanted to play a, a couple of uh, short solo pieces from a couple of my books because... Uh, uh, the chord melody stuff? Yeah, yeah, but that's a whole different... Oh, okay, process. we so will definitely good. save time for that because we haven't talked about, you know, I was blown away by your whole chord melody bag, but play the other blues or okay, whatever you were going to play yeah, and we'll, we'll definitely get a chord melody piece in there. This one, some of you uh, will have heard. Let's see. Ah, uh, we're showing on screen now your pedal board for the Steely Dan Tour 2019. All oh, right. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right, here's another one. All right, man. This is a fun one.
Oh man. I, you know, I'm just listening to you and hearing you play and we miss you terribly, man. Uh, you, you've got to, once things get back in action, you got to squeeze in and come down and do another ear IQ, something or other, I just, so. I would just so that we can hang a bit, man. Um, okay. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you some questions. Yeah. Then we're going to talk about your channel, which I think is an, another one of our most extraordinary learning experiences and a great way for folks to connect with someone of your stature. And then you're going to uh, play a little chord melody and talk about what you <laughs> yeah. do with that. Okay. So here's some questions. Uh, Bill Willett says, would love to know if your parents pushed you to play when you were a kid or was it love at first note? <laughs> Well, thankfully it was a musical home, but um, they, they pushed me to play piano, which which I kind of agreed to do for maybe a year uh, yeah. as, a, as a pretty little kid. And then I just refused and uh, <laughs> I got really stubborn and didn't want to do it. And I, I'm sorry that that was the case. Um, so I, I said no in, in some ways, but soon after that, um, I was playing saxophone in grade school. And once I got a guitar in my hands, then, and really, it was a function of the music that was, you know, on the radio at the time. I, I was, I fell in love with the Beatles and and uh, and British invasion, British invasion rock and roll, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just spent all all of my free hours on the porch of my parents' place, dropping the needle on records and, and just trying to figure it out whether it was on piano or on guitar. But from that time, once I got bitten by the bug to sort of figure out how this this magical thing called music worked and started like being able to sort of figure it out. I mean, as lame as my first attempts may, may have been, um, there was, there was no stopping me because of, because it was just pure. I was, the motivation was so pure because I just loved the music. So awesome. Out of curiosity, were you a big uh, Steely Dan fan well, when yeah. you were younger? Yeah, I, I was. Um, I didn't have every record of theirs, but but you know, I was I was a by the time they were releasing uh, records, I was I was basically doing gigs in bars all the time, uh -huh. and so you know there were several of them that were you know bar staples like uh, you know Real in the Years and Ricky Don't oh, yeah. Number things like that. You know we were we were peg we were playing those tunes in, in bar bands. So uh, you know there was there was a local band that used to do the ambitious ones like Asia and all that stuff. Uh -huh. It was kind of in the air and, and yeah, I was a huge fan. I always was a bigger fan of the later records, um, uh, but but there are gems on every single one. Oh, every single one. It's just amazing, really. Um, James Taylor asks, for all I know, it could be the James Taylor. Um, we, we actually spoke to his brother Livingston Taylor two days ago. I don't, I th um, there's another James Taylor, but my bet is it's the other James Taylor I know. He wants to know, he noticed you were doing some hybrid picking. Is that something you use a lot? You know, it's funny. I, I find myself using it more uh, all the time. I'm not sure exactly why. There is something... Um, there, there is something about the sound, especially when you have an overdriven uh, guitar tone, but not just then, because I've always been a fan of, uh, I mean, even, even in the jazz world, Wes Montgomery's sound is just undeniably beautiful because, and it's because it's, it's skin, I think, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but there's something about, like, like when you listen to like a, a sound, um, like this cranked up sound I've been using basically. Uh, why is that not sound? Oh, no. You play a note with it, and then play it with your finger, mm -hmm. or your thumb, you get a little that, that snap, you know. You can kind of get it with a pick, but not the same way. So I think there's, there's something about the unpredictability of the overtones that you get mm -hmm. uh, from skin, as opposed to the pick. The pick is a little, in terms of sound production, it's more consistent. But in that way, it's less interesting, it, or mm -hmm. it can be, you know? So there, there's more variety. Uh, and, and to me, it's the, because I'm not good with my fingers or my thumb, um, there's even more variety because I'm not consistent. So mm -hmm. I can't control it even if I try. And some of that, I, I, I think I like some of the variability of it and the sort of 
the sort of surprise of it. Um, um, but sometimes it's just easier. For instance, that uh, I did something like this uh, with, uh, you know, like I could do it with with a pick, but but it's so effortful sounding. Right, right. And you and with the fingers, you can play it lighter, and you can get this thing rolling. I don't have chops like that. I wish I did. But I started thinking about it more when I when I was playing slide a little bit more because. With the slide, you're busy muting all the stuff. That your right hand is just busy. So, uh, it, but but it still it always sounded better to me to play with with the the fingers on the on the slide. Somehow the tone is is more interesting or something. It's more compelling somehow. And that's not always the case. And and there are certain things you can do with a pick that you can only do with a pick. And uh, I mean, it's to try to play like you know, like a funky uh, a funky guitar like a. I mean, it's not as easy with without a pick. The pick is great for certain things mm -hmm. like that in particular, and and for certain for certain things, you know, like the I, I'm not good at it, but like look what Frank Gambale could do with a pick. Or, oh or, yeah, <laughs> and, and a, a much a much less advanced uh, thing, but 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 the beautiful thing that Benson can do too with that, like you know, like, you know, like a, when you can get the, uh, the you know, like get things. Things rolling like and mm -hmm. that stuff. I mean, if you try to do that with alternate picking, it's just again, it sounds so effortful. Right. That's too hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's just almost about. But, but it's light and effortless sounding if you can get it together. I don't really have it together, but. Good answer, but some man. Some guys are great at that, you know. So. Um, Dave K wants to know what strings and gauge you use. Well. Um, these, uh, I've been using the same string uh, pretty much with, with, with maybe a few years off from the time I was a, a high school kid. And uh, they're Ernie Ball rock and roll uh, slinkies, I guess they're called. Um, they're the ones with, uh, they're just a nickel wrapper, not the stainless steel ones. And they don't have to, nothing fancy. They're the same ones I've been using all my life basically. so uh, they're, they're nines gauge, they're gauged tens is the one tens when i was younger i did use like when i was a kid i, I think i used probably nines but uh, no i've been using tens for a long long time and i even though there are certain certain times i think a heavier gauge would sound better for certain things for instance mm -hmm. this chord st solo stuff you know it's a jazz style really and it would sound much much better with a heavier string i uh i sort of had to give up changing guitars a lot and changing string gauges and setups because I, I found it it's sort of too confusing for my my playing identity and and too really honestly too hard on my left arm because mm -hmm. I've had some injuries over the course of my playing career and uh, and so I have to sort of I have to take it easy and I have to sort of play a, 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 a consistent predictable sort of feeling setup to, to, to feel like I can be at my best but that that does mean there are compromises because it doesn't sound as good i think for certain sounds certain styles i think would be better with mm -hmm. a heavier gauge um, but. cool um and then anand asks i'm not sure if you're doing well uh going back this is going back a little bit to your description of the g note against the b minor seven yeah. as being somewhat unusual what if the song itself is in the key of G major? Yeah, well, there might be a way that would, that, I mean, if, if you had a song in G major and it was going, and it got to the D minor seven, like, uh, yeah, it, it would be different. Um, I think the, the song that was in my mind was the blues that we were doing. I remember that one. And, uh, and so that was, I was thinking of it as, as the home bass tonic chord of the mm -hmm. song. And then the G sounds like a foreigner, right? Uh, for sure. If uh, if you're, you know, like uh, it doesn't sound so wrong at all. Right. You can, right. It's, it's like a. It's the note you would go through. It's still not a chord tone. So hanging on it, you know, like you're still gonna hear. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what's gonna bother a lot of people's ears if you just sort of you know, insist on it, you know. but, uh, but certainly as a note to pass through, it's the right note in that key to pass through when this one 
wouldn't that would sound like whoa like mm -hmm. that one so the g sharp would be the bigger reject but my i think that the important point is that you want to get a sense uh you definitely want to consider context where you are in in the song what has come before in the song um, you don't have to get fancy about naming the keys even but you do have to listen carefully and remember where you've been so if the song came from a G major 7 to an A minor 7 then up to a B minor 7 that's created a context which in which that G is going to sound less less off than it would in a context where that G just never Yeah is. it's it's very cool because you've just uh, these are the principles you'll learn as you go through John's first true fire course reactive improvisation um, it's, it's kind of cool to see you actually apply that uh, you know, in context with that question. So we, we did talk about reactive improvisation, that course. We talked about soloing strategies, that course. The links to those courses are underneath the video. Um, but quickly tell us about your channel. I love what you're doing in that channel. Tell folks what's happening there. Well, my, my first idea was to try to to try to use the, the sort of vehicle of the channel as a place to, to share the most important things that I felt had contributed to getting me to the place I ultimately arrived at uh, as far as my abilities on the guitar and my knowledge of the guitar. So I think to me that was the, that was the core of what I wanted to present there. Um, it's, it's sort of, I think it's kind of, pretty deep instructional stuff that uh, is painstaking to go through. And, and, you know, it could take people, it took me several years to go through all that stuff, but I tried to sort of set it up in the channel in a way where all that stuff is there because, you know, uh, on the channel, of course, it's open to all sorts of uh, different levels of guitar players. So I, I, I didn't want to sort of, make people who were at a, at a more advanced level wait until, you know, for months or a year until they get to something that challenges them. So I, I, I basically took about six months and prepared all this stuff that I thought represented the most important stuff that I had, that I think one should study if to, to sort of get to the understanding of the guitar fingerboard and, and just how this thing works, you know, um, for me, you know. So, so I tried to just put as much of it there as I could, and and there's there's still more to go, but most of it is there now, and I th I think to me like the, the 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 center of that is that fingerboard section. There's a, mm -hmm. a couple categories: it's single notes and then chord inversions, and to me that stuff is it's so difficult. If you don't have a lot of time to put in every day, you, you might want to limit yourself to only a few minutes a day, but. This will take you years at that at that rate. You know, it's, it's <laughs> years worth of stuff. You know, and and it's difficult, but better than anything else I've ever studied. And, and this was all given to me by uh, the, the late great Harry Leahy, uh, a teacher who lived in Plainfield, New Jersey, that I studied with for many years. And um, to me, it just was a, a total mind opener in terms of like like what you can do on the guitar because it's a confusing visual layout it's uh the only way the guitar is friendly is in a chromatic way where you can you know you, you play a chord and, and you don't you can change play in every key without changing anything try doing that on a piano right you, know, you gotta know a lot to do that, right you know? and it's hard but um on the guitar it's easy but almost everything else on the guitar is hard so and, and it's it's got this nasty you know, you know like that's that nasty like one little interval different which destroys all the symmetry of the fingerboard mm -hmm. is a nightmare but it's we wouldn't trade it because it's what allows you to play so many like of those great open string chords and mm -hmm. and so much music depends on it you can't play so much music if you tr if you try to tune it symmetrically it's not going to work but so it's a really it's a challenging design but it's really worth plowing through to sort of eliminate the, that sort of visit, 
that that visual sort of confusion, you know, and and, and that's what that fingerboard section to me in the in my channel. Yeah, that that <laughs> section's incredible. You know, you have a hundred and seventy six videos in here, okay. seventy six tabs, charts, jam tracks, discussion threads. Um, this is the joint to you know if you want to connect. <laughs> with John in a real way here um, and go way beyond what we're able to do, you know, in the ear IQ courses, here's, here's your joint. Um, you can subscribe here for $10 a month, have access to all of the videos. Um, he also offers a, um, uh, a subscription with one monthly private lesson. I, I love this notion of being able to, you know, most of us can't do like a weekly, regular private lesson, but, you know, being able to kind of check in with you and get a couple of questions answered and some tips and a little bit of mentorship is, you know, just it's priceless, man. Um, and, you know, the sections you have, I mean, you go into, you've got Donald Fagan tunes, Steely Dan yeah, reviews, <laughs> uh, songwriting, uh, I mean, soloing, gear, the whole, I mean, it's all there. Again, this is, you will not be disappointed. Give that a shot. We've got the link to it underneath the video. And one of my favorite sections is the arrangements for guitar which is a perfect setup for you to show us something. Yeah, yeah I, I, have, I have a couple that I, uh, that I could play, one from each book. The, the first one is uh, this one here. I don't know if you can see that. But, uh, yeah. That's, uh, and um, there's a tune in there uh, called My Funny Valentine, which people all know, I'm sure, that uh, I will uh, I'll just play. Let's see. <laughs> That's that one. Beautiful, man. Um, you've gotten only the tip of the iceberg of how deep, <laughs> how deep John's waters go, man. Um, thank you so much for your time today. I really so much appreciate you carving out that time and preparing all of this. We, we miss you terribly. Well, it's been my um, pleasure, Brad. It's, 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 it's the closest thing to a gig I have. <laughs> so well, I listen, man, uh, thoroughly enjoyed it all. I love your channel. Um, I reference those ear IQ courses all of the time. Every, every time I go back, I pick up an, another new little thing. Uh, those, those are pretty deep waters too, um, but very insightful. And uh, I hope you stay safe. I hope you stay sound. And again, I hope you carve out a couple of days for us to come on down and, you know, let's do another one of these things. I'd love to. Thanks so much, Brad. Great. Thank you, man. Thanks, John. Thanks, we'll see you again soon. Hope so.